Okay, brother, you are. Home. All right, guy, get up against the wall. Let me see some ID, guy. They kill me with that. Yeah. Go ahead, mom. Oh, it's on. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> greetings. All right. Good evening. Greetings. Uh, we're coming to you live from Urus or Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, and uh, from the Moorish American Society of Comprehensive Science also known as the Moorish Society of Admaurium, of the Talismanic Kingdom of Admaurium. Um, let's see. Again, as I said, we talked about a lot of things yesterday um, about the United States. I know that's one of the uh, areas of interest that uh, our sister Bird Lockett has concerning the uh, beginnings of the United States Corporation uh, in and throughout the continental United States, i.e. the Americas. And uh, so, but in order to comprehend the myriad of Axel events in and throughout the Americas uh, and the Moorish Empire on a whole, um, or to have an accurate anecdotal account, we must look and explore uh, the events of the planetary and galactical conditions involving Mars, Earth, and the days of Atlantis. Now, of course, a lot of people will ask, well, what does that have to do with the United States? It has a lot to do with it. Um, and uh, when we look at the events and things which occurred in Atlantis some 16,000, 20,000 years ago, and even a million years ago, we can better comprehend and uh, have an overall comprehension of exactly what occurred, or shall I say the cause and effect um, of ultimately what happened in the continental United States. So uh, we then consider early Atlantis, Kemet, uh, Axis, consciousness grid changes, uh, Eschaic logometers, um, which is another way of saying Akashic records, lifelines of those Akashic records, uh, Moorish talismanic thaumatergy. Uh, thaumatergy is basically another term that's used for magic or ancient magic. Um, we're also going to look at the science of ancestral incantations involving thaumatergy, uh, utilizing specific tones and language or languages of light. We're going to look at genealogy as well as true geography. Um, now, I know that uh, is, uh, is a lot, but as I said, all of these things relate directly and indirectly to uh, the history and the origins of the United States Corporation and why it was formed, etc. But as I said, going back to the time of Atlantis, when we look at um, about 20,000 years ago, there was a process that occurred uh, that involved the Moors of Atlantis at that time. You also had Moors on uh, Mars, and um, you also had Moors who were living underground at that time. These were uh, masters, ascended masters uh, from the sixth dimension, and uh, I'll talk more about them in a minute. But the Moors that were actually living on Atlantis at that time, unfortunately, were involved in some experiments uh, similar to that of the Philadelphia experiment um, in the 40s uh, involving time travel. And uh, unfortunately, they lost control of this experiment. And when uh, things got out of control, ultimately it caused the cataclysmic event or destruction of Atlantis, um, the Ten Islands of Atlantis, and um, in addition to which, uh, it ripped a series of holes through a number of dimensions. Um, and ultimately, that's what caused the uh, problems that occurred in and throughout the Moorish Empire uh, from that time up until the present. So as to questions about the decline of the Moorish Empire, uh, you then again have to go back to these events, uh, these experiments that they were conducting uh, in Atlantis. 
And uh, so when the time or the time machine experiment got out of control, uh, as I said, it ripped holes in, in the dimension. And, um, and so consequently, it also caused an axis or planetary axis shift. And when the planetary axis shift occurred, um, it literally affected everything uh, on the planet, um, including human memory uh, or human memory retention, because human memory is uh, largely dependent on magnetic fields. And the magnetic field of the Earth uh, literally collapsed and was affected because of the uh, planetary axis shift and, as I said, also because of this uh, particular experiment that they were conducting. Um, and so, uh, after this occurred, or after this time, you had the many of the ascended masters from the sixth dimension who came back to Earth uh, to assist the Moors um, that dispersed over various parts of the of the planet of the globe uh, in Kemet, um, in the Americas, and many other places, Peru, etc. And um, and so, in order to assist the Moors, uh, what they did was that they started a process known as stair step evolution, um, because the Moors at that time from Atlantis had literally gone back into a state of Berberism or so-called barbarism. Um, and uh, they had lost a lot of the information, the sciences, etc., that they had once learned uh, or mastered in Atlantis. And so, uh, through a series of, of uh, instructions, these ascended masters in what was known as the Tat Brotherhood, um, they would, through the stair-step evolutionary process, they would instruct these Moors in different areas of sciences in hopes that they would uh, regain or recall much of what was lost. Um, unfortunately, such was not the case. It didn't, it didn't really take. And so, uh, unfortunately, thereafter, you had a downward spiral that occurred. And thus, this is what brought in um, another experiment, but one of which was or proved to be um, uh, a positive experiment in the creation of the uh, the ancient pharaoh known as Akhenaten, or some know him as Agantum. And uh, anyway, Akhenaten was an immortal being who was created, and uh, for the sole purpose of introducing uh, what is known as Una Mains Consciousness, or One Mind or Unity Consciousness. And it was basically to uh, bring the Moors to another level of consciousness, uh, these Moors in particular, as I said, in Atlantis, who had lost a lot of uh, their memory and the sciences. And so, in attempting to introduce the Unamens consciousness, uh, they did this through establishing what later became known as the ancient mystery system of Kemet, uh, which actually stemmed from the Nikal Mystery School of Atlantis. And in these schools, uh, they instructed many of the Moors in um, uh, uh, many of the high sciences, breathing techniques, uh, as I said, uh, language tones or, or tones and of languages of light, uh, so as to raise their consciousness uh, to bring them in harmony with the grids. Um, as a matter of fact, just backtracking a little, when the uh, magnetic field collapsed um, back in Atlantis, or during the time of Atlantis, um, ultimately what happened was that not only did it affect the human memory, but it also affected the grids. Um, and so what these ascended masters had to do was that they had to actually plug into the grid consciousness of the planet uh, the logarithmic spiral grids of the planet in various uh, parts or, or key positions of the Earth in order to, again, uh, assist these Moors in helping to raise their consciousness. And so, when we look at um, these different techniques 
uh, involving the languages, the tones of the languages, etc., in particular ancient languages uh, that you'll find, like for example, in the ancient Moabite, uh, the Adamaic, um, many of the Kemetic languages, tones, etc. Um, the one thing of which I find to be very interesting that most people don't touch on, even for those that deal with etymology, is that when you're talking about these particular ancient languages and these tones that help to um, respatialize the organism uh, so as to raise the harmonic level of the body uh, and consciousness on a whole, is that these languages are actually alkaline-based languages. Now, I know we think of, you know, alkaline in terms of, you know, foods, different types of foods we eat, etc. Uh, but these particular languages were alkaline-based as opposed to the acidic uh, dialects and languages that we use today. As, for example, not so much the English language. So don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with the English language per se because it was actually one of many languages that was created by the Moors. Uh, it's just that the modern Albion, so-called English, uh, European dialect that we've adopted is the problem. Um, and this particular dialect is acidic and also electrical as opposed to the alkaline base languages of which I'm talking about, which are also highly magnetic. And so, again, when we look at these particular languages uh, that I mentioned, they actually feed the melanin. Um, in addition to raising the consciousness, and they're high resonating. Uh, they're also carbon and silicon based, uh, which are two of perhaps uh, two of the most unique elements on the periodic table of, of elements. Um, and so the carbon and silicon based um, languages that again feed the melanin, um, I should also include in that list Moorish Latin or ancient Moorish Latin. Now, um, all of these ancient tonal, uh, tonal patterns actually mimic uh, the pattern of melanin. Um, and uh, as I said, as opposed to the acidic electrical dialect that we're using in the so-called English language. Um, and which, by the way, uh, when I say acids, I mean infectious or an infectious saturation of acids of the blood and bones. And this is symptomatic of what is known as Cretanism. Now, many of you know that the definition of uh, Christian is Cretan, and Cretan is Christian. Um, but now, if we take it a step further, we look at Cretanism. And Cretanism is actually a form of Mike's edema. Um, Mike's edema is basically an underactive uh, thyroid, or, or an underactive thyroid gland known as hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, which basically is a poor binding process of iodine to a group of amino acids of a glycoprotein made in the thyroid gland. And these amino acids are tyrosine residues uh, in the thyroglobulin, or TGB, which are precursor hormones of thyroxine and triadothyronine, T3 and T4. Uh, and uh, this particular iodine deficiency also um, shows itself in blood disorders, um, which again, like I said, this is all a pattern of the acidic uh, dialect of so-called English that we're using. Um, and thus is the reason why the European is so insistent on us using uh, this particular dialect that works for him, you know, in his customs, in what he calls law, but is not law, but is actually a custom being imposed upon us, um, but it doesn't really work for us for the simple reason of what I had explained earlier about it not being um, a magnetic, uh, alkaline-based language. Um, and so, as I said, this is also indicative of being linguistically strung out on methadone hydrochloride. Now, what do I, what do I mean by that? When I say methadone hydrochloride, um, in terms of this acidic language that uh, I'm referring to and the poor binding process of iodine. Um, I'm basically talking about uh, a form of mathematics. 
So when we talk about language, we have to consider mathematics, we have to consider uh, the helixography, the DNA and RNA of language, uh, or the genetics of language, um, and a whole host of other things. But, as I said, uh, so when we're talking about mathematics, we're talking about methodology. And so math is meth. Okay, so as a matter of fact, which is the abbreviation or slang for, again, methadone. Uh, so we're talking about a, a corrupt form of mathematics that has been imposed or superimposed on our people. Um, now, I know this may sound kind of strange to some extent because it's like, okay, you started out with Atlantis and you said that it has some relation or correlation to the United States uh, and the United States Corporation, and it does. But all of these things have to be considered, as I said, in terms of cause and effect to see exactly uh, how this played into the dynamic of the Moorish Empire, uh, the ebb and flow of the Moorish Empire from Anatolia uh, to the Crimea, all the way back to the Americas, Latinum, uh, known as Moorish Spain, uh, and other parts of the Moorish Empire. In fact, uh, not to get away from the, uh, the methadone effect, is that, so we're talking about a corruption of language, and we're talking about a corruption of language, we're talking about something which is foreign and therefore barbaric, because barbaric or barbarian means foreign. Um, and so when we understand it from that particular perspective, then we're looking at those who are on a day-to-day -day basis, meaning the Albion male, uh, of whom again is imposing the acidic electrical or electrically charged dialect uh, upon our people are, are daily seeking convictions uh, via their court system. And so when you look at the fact that they're constantly seeking convictions of our people, conviction is actually dealing with what? Language as well, because when you say something, you say it with conviction, as in the case of someone being convicted by a jury of their so-called peers, they're actually saying it with what? Conviction and in addition to which is a form of damnation. So they're actually looking to uh, convict you uh, for eternal damnation in the Cretan system. Um, and so, uh, the, this is what has played an integral part or integral role in, again, the dynamic of the, uh, the Moorish Empire, particularly in and throughout the United States. So now, when we look at the uh, beginnings of the Moorish um, corporate family trust, known as the United States, or more commonly known as the United States, it's important to understand that it was not originally known as the United States uh, in 1774. That is what has become a common appellative. Um, but if you do any research and you look at the uh, the Annales Continens. The Annales Continens is the continental records, which prior to that was known as um, the Annales Imperium, which was the imperial records. And now in the imperial in imperial records, you have what is known as the Consociuimos Regnum. The Consociuimos Regnum was a consolidation or a convocation of 13 royal families. Those royal families were Moorish families uh, that basically consolidated their power for a number of reasons of which I'll go into uh, in forming this uh, corporate family trust, again, as I said, that we call the United States Corporation. Um, and they did this uh, under what was known as the Capitis Socaetas, known to you as the Articles of Association, and three years later, the Capitis uh, Civitatis, known as the Articles of Confederation. Um, however, as you can see from the names that I'm giving, or the terminology uh, that's being used, is that these documents were not uh, originally in English. Uh, many of them were in the ancient Moorish Latin uh, language. Um, Again, as I said, if you uh, do any extensive research, uh, if you look in um, 
There are particular sections in the Library of Congress, as well as the Department of State Library, of which only very few people have access to, um, that will give you more information on uh, the early years of the forming of the United States Corporation. Um, at any rate, um, as I said, it was essentially or loosely termed Consociumus Regnum, which basically was an act. It was not uh, a name per se that was used for the United States, because when you say Consociumus Regnum, uh, Consociumus me basically means that um, we have united, meaning that we have done something, or a group of us have done something, meaning we nobles or we membrana of this particular thing that we have formed, um, uh, or these United Kingdoms. And so, Consociumus Regnum um, was the consolidation or convocation of these 13 kingdoms. Uh, but what has happened with the whole United States aspect is that they've been using um, an indicative verbal action in the noun sense, or nonsense, if you will. Meaning that when they say the United States, obviously they're using a definite article, the, and so therefore using it in the noun sense. But when you say anything, even according to the rules of English, and you add an ED like I walked to the store, obviously that indicates that you've done something as in a verbal action. Um, and therefore cannot be used uh, as a name or again in the noun sense. So <clears throat> these particular 13 kingdoms, uh, later misnamed colonies and states, had rulers known as bais, bags, or beglabegs. Um, and uh, these bay titles were titles that were also used by uh, the first ruler of China, known as Qinbai, and of course also used uh, in the Osman, the Moorish Osman Empire, uh, more commonly known as the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Bay or Bay title. But anyway, these Bays or Bay rulers on the continent in the 1760s and 70s were kings, princes, and governors owing allegiance to the Sultan at that time, uh, Sayyidi Ibn Abdul Muhammad the 17th, uh, who ruled between 1757 and 1790 from Marrakesh. Now Marrakesh at that time was uh, Philadelphus or Philadelphia, uh, which was both, uh, this was a part of Mauritania or Mauritania, and Mauritania was actually in North and South Dakota, uh, here in North America. And uh, of course Marrakesh, as I said, was Philadelphia, and Marrakesh, which later became known as Morocco, uh, means uh, sons of Cush. And, uh, and so, um, this royal family, or convocation of royal families, rather, the 13 royal families, uh, some of the names, if you read in the uh, imperial records or the continental records, uh, as opposed to the congressional records, um, some of the names were Agenor, uh, Agathokies, um, Ayak, Barca, which, by the way, Barca is another name or an ancient name for Chicago. Um, and after Barca, it became known as Libya or uh, Ludim. And the people, the Moorish people, were known as Lachabim at that time. Uh, but anyway, as I said, one of the names, Ayak, the English equivalent, believe it or not, would be Ajax. So what they've done is the Albion has reduced many of these royal names and titles to toilet cleansers and other derogatory things, um, which I find to be very interesting. Now, also the name Agathokies, which as I said was one of the names of the royal families, is where we get the Aga title for governor, which is of course also used in the, uh, the Turkish language as well. Um, but anyway, as I said, many of these legal documents uh, were not in the lingua anglique or the English language uh, until actually a century later. So, um, again, you're looking at uh, the time of the federal Christian European influence under bankruptcy reconstruction between 1861 and 1878, 
which was one of the reasons, apart from many reasons, of the Civil War, because it was to give them enough time to actually change or alter many of the salient records um, to, as I said, to translate them, to omit things by, again, omission or commission. And um, so it gave them enough time to pray and alter these records and to ultimately give you the popularized versions that you read today in your miseducation uh, system. And so the original, of course, is always under lock and key, and you get the neutered version or, or neutered translation. But back to 1774, when the Corporate Family Trust was uh, organized um, or created, uh, one of the main reasons for the convocation or consolidation was due to the fact that the Moorish sway in the Americas was on the fast track of decline because of the 300 years continental wars between uh, the Franciscan Dutch and the Mossarabs. The Mossarabs is basically another term, a name for uh, Cretan or Christian Spaniards. Uh, now during this time, during the 300 years continental wars, uh, you had many of the older generations of Moors who were dying off Many were prisoners of war. Uh, the newer generations were being born in war camps um, and were now being nationally lobotomized via Cretan reclassification and socio-behavioral modification. Uh, and this is what Prophet Nobudrali is referring to in chapter 47, verses 16 and 17, when he tells us that through sin and disobedience, every nation has suffered slavery due to the fact that they honored not the Cretan principles of their of their fathers or forefathers, uh, and this is why the nationality of the Moors was taken away from them in 1774, and the words Negro, Black, and Colored were given to the Asiatics of America uh, who were of Moorish descent. Um, and uh, so anyway, but the, the loss of nationality, even though it's understood that the, Mo the nationality of the Moors was taken away in 1774, it's important to understand that the nationality meant the majority of Moors and not all of the Moors, including, for example, the royals uh, of the Continental, what later became the Continental Congress, and about a thousand Moorish factions. Um, but understanding the seriousness of the situation, these Moors uh, of the Royal Convocation, uh, was again the fundamental reason for one, the formation of the Corporate Family Trust, the National Trust, um, in again what later became the United States, and two, the establishing of the federal political system for the Albion Mail, uh, as this was a part of the Moore's C3 Communications Operation Command Stratagem, or military strategy, uh, that was used to, as strange as it may sound to some, um, it was to ensure the survival of future generations. Uh, you should also know uh, that even though the Moors, uh, or the Moorish Navy rather, more specifically fell in West Palestine uh, on the Sea of Galilee in uh, 1795, the royal families nonetheless were still running government from behind the scenes until Civil War era reconstruction. Uh, so initially, the congressional membership consisted of the above 13 rulers and key family members that eventually comprised 35 members and finally the 20 observers. Uh, only the, the Bay kings, princes, and governors were eligible to serve as Preissens, or president, commander-in-chief, uh, of which there were between the years of 1774 and 89, 16 to be exact, uh, who not only did they, like presidents of the modern era, sign congressional laws, treaties, military orders, but in addition presided over judicial congressional cases. And in 1775, under the Henry Middleton and Peyton Randolph second term administration was the beginning of the so-called or infamous uh, American Revolution. Now what's very interesting about this is because of how we've been again miseducated and taught history, etc. We tend to look at it uh, compartmentally. In other words, we think of the American Revolution, okay, Christmas Attics, that whole thing, and uh, Boston, uh, and uh, Paul Revere, etc and nothing else was going on. But as I mentioned earlier, you had a 300 years continental war that was going on in many parts of the continent. Um, in parts of, uh, what is it, uh, Guaymicuna, known as Panama, 
Marco Tucano Witoto, known as Colombia, uh, Yonamam, Arua Carib, Venezuela, uh, Utuapaque Pima, Mexico, Maya, Guatemala, uh, Arucanian, Chile, uh, Diaguita, Bolivia, and Apibon, Paraguay. Uh, so, in 1775, this American Revolution took place principally uh, in the northeast areas of Brutium, um, what is it, uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, uh, and Idumia, which are known, Brutium was actually also known as uh, Pergamos, which if uh, you read the so-called Christian Bible in Revelations, they talk about Pergamos, uh, which is uh, Brutium, Massachusetts, Another name for it was Komasa Kumkanit, which I'll talk about that in a minute concerning Hano Bay's uh, legal document of the Bornstone, um, which is an ancient document, ancient Moorish document, uh, that I also talk about in uh, Libretto 7 of the Consecrated Talisman, which is the Moabite Proclamation of Hano Bay, uh, legal document annexation of the Americas to the Iberian Peninsula. Now, uh, but anyway, getting back to Brutium and where the war, uh, the American Revolution was principally fought, as I said, in Brutium, uh, Massachusetts, um, uh, Jerusalem, which is Jerusalem, uh, also known as Fez Huetas, or Old Fez, which is actually New York. Bethlehem, as I mentioned, is actually uh, Pittsburgh. And Idumia, um, or Edom, is Virginia. Now, we've learned about the ruddy, pale-skinned man, or the so-called, the, the true red, uh, red man, um, who basically settled in Virginia, uh, and is actually where they uh, were, how shall I say, immured in the, in the uh, penal colony for a time. But uh, nonetheless, Idumia was actually Edom, and as you know, Edom means red or ruddy. So, as I said, Principally, between uh, this war took place between the Brutish Moors of Brutium, hence is one of the reasons why they were named Brutish, um, and then you had the Brutish or British Amalgamated Moors of England, um, and these two factions were actually warring with the uh, Albion, a so-called English subject male, and. Um, and so, as I said, you had the two factions of Moors that were called Brutish. Um, and they were called Brutish or British because of a covenant that they had bet between one another, or between the two uh, families, as it were. Uh, hence is where you get the term Brit, or Brit, which means covenant, uh, from the ancient Moabite and Hebrew. And we see evidence of this in the January 23rd, uh, 1721 treaty between... Um, the Moors of Marrakesh, and also the Moors of the Amalgamated Moors of England. Now, just to backtrack for a minute, I talked about Komasa Kumkanit, Cape Cod Bay, um, Massachusetts, and the Bornstone, which, as I said, is an ancient legal document dating back to about 500 BCE, and this gets into, again, uh, the whole land title issue. Um, and um, I, I also cover this, or talk about this, in... Uh, Libretto II of the Consecrated Talisman, which is an absolute land conveyance document um, that's documented or recorded or archived uh, in Homeland Security. Um, it's in the Royal Archives of the Medina Sidonia family in Spain, uh, Latino. Um, it's also in the Department of State, etc. But anyway, this particular document, uh, Libretto II, is titled uh, Geográficas para Materia Que Familiae Analis. Uh, Imperium Morosium ac Gentilicio Sanguinis, which is the Great Geodetic Survey and Family Chronicle of the Moorish Empire and its Blood Right Heirs, which basically um, is a survey, a global survey, again, geodetic survey of the entire globe, uh, giving you the meets and bounds, etc. And this document is to be used in conjunction um, with the Bornstone. Now, what's very interesting about that is also as to how we've been conditioned or trained to see things, um, is we think of these ancient uh, monoliths, um, pyramids, and things like that, 
as artifacts, um, which is a term, a popularized term that's used by so-called archaeologists, uh, grave robbers, whatever you want to call them. But um, these things are actually legal documents and should be used in every and all instances concerning um, uh, so-called claims to land. And I say so-called claims because claim is, is actually an illegal term. But in terms of asserting rights, uh, birthright inherited rights to the land, uh, these, um, these uh, particular monoliths, structures, etc., should be used as legal documents because, in fact, they are. Um, so before I go any further with that, I wanted to know were there any questions about that?